Hello and welcome to another video in the SERGS showcase series. I am delighted to introduce Professor David Reid, who is Professorial Fellow in Chemical Education at the University of Southampton in the UK. David's background from his PhD in Organic Chemistry, postdoctoral work in the USA, followed by training as a chemistry school teacher, has led him to contribute extensively to chemistry teaching, particularly at the school university divide, where David is now head of the education group and director of outreach chemistry at the University of Southampton. In 2010, David was a recipient of the prestigious Royal Society of Chemistry's Higher Education Teaching Award and in 2017 was awarded a National Teaching Fellowship for his work. David's presentation is called Tentative Steps in the Direction of Chemistry Education Research. Hello, I'm David Reid. Uh, it's a great privilege to be able to contribute to the RSC SERG Showcase series, so thank you very much to uh, Suzanne and Michael for inviting me. Uh, and I thought a title, the title I thought I'd use is Tentative Steps in the Direction of CER. Um, because I wouldn't classify myself as a full-blown researcher, but we're, we're certainly dabbling on that front. So how did I get involved with this kind of thing? If I think back to my time as a school teacher, we were bombarded with initiatives regularly, things like the national strategies. We were told we had to write the learning objectives for the lesson on the board. Uh, we were told to make sure the students had a chance to respond to the feedback that we gave them. And these all seem like good ideas, uh, but the question I always had was, why? What's the evidence? What is it that's telling us we should do it this way? And that evidence wasn't always forthcoming. Uh, so it did sort of make me question uh, the approaches we were taking. And then when I came to the university, and uh, my initial role was to work with colleagues to initiate some change, to introduce more innovation into the teaching, uh, perhaps over-egging it by saying it was a big battle. Um, it, it wasn't that much of a battle. There were people that were very keen to do this stuff. But it did get harder. And the question I was faced with was, what's the evidence? Um, so again, that was what made me engage more with that wider body of literature. Once I came to the university, I realised there was stuff there, and it was actually stuff I could access easily. So thinking about our innovations that we were doing, uh, obviously we don't innovate for the sake of it. We normally have a problem that we're trying to solve, so we, we ask that question. And then we think about what can we learn from others, and I think that's where the, the research starts to come into this. So learn from them and then design, trial, implement and evaluate whatever it is that you're doing and then subsequently reflect and refine on that and then feed that back into the next cycle. And I look at this as being a sort of cycle of scholarship uh, and this is what I apply to all the innovations that I've worked on and um, I'd like to think that if you increase the rigour at various different stages here that that, that then turns into proper research. Of course you always need great ideas at all stages and quite often those ideas could come from the literature or from seeing someone talk about something at a conference. I've picked up many things that I've borrowed from people. Um, but also it's very important to discuss these things with other people and I certainly find if I bounce ideas off others those ideas get better. So interaction, very important. So we're quite lucky in chemistry that there are plenty of uh, places where we can go to for literature, we can go to conferences, Many, many opportunities for personal discussions. We've got such a good tight-knit community. And of course, there's Twitter as well. And all these things can feed into the early stages of the cycle of scholarship. And of course, if we're doing it properly, we can disseminate our work and feed back into that wider body of evidence. And as I've said, yes, there are plenty of opportunities. We've got Education in Chemistry, New Directions, SERP, JChemEd. Obviously, here in the UK, we've got the annual ViceFec conference, which is growing in popularity, is really good this year. It's always really good, of course. Um, and it would be remiss of me to mention Twitter without obviously mentioning Simon, who uh, played a big role in getting many of us active on Twitter. For me, the turning point was Vice in 2011, uh, when after pressure from Simon, I suddenly started tweeting and I haven't looked back since. So um, how did that then move on? How did we actually start doing some, some proper research? that moved beyond the realms of scholarship. Um, I think back to when I started on the Science Foundation here in 2012. Before that, I'd done quite a lot of work supporting colleagues in enhancing their teaching, and I'd done a bit of lecturing here and there. But this was the first time I took on a, a really serious uh, bit of teaching as part of a module. I had to deliver in 72 lectures what I was doing in two years as an A-level teacher previously. 
So unfortunately that meant that my lectures were quite content heavy. And I'll show you this quote uh, which was taken from a module evaluation form at the end of the year. Obviously I'm quite happy with the first bit, uh, but the second bit is uh, a pretty damning indictment of my teaching, con considering I'm someone who's supposed to be an innovator. Uh, so this was something I needed to address. And it, it kind of made me think about this image that I'd seen in various places. I've seen Simon Bates use that, and a, a guy called Don Clark I saw at the ALT conference one year. Uh, I think that there were some active students at the front of my lectures, but then perhaps the learning wasn't so good more towards the back. And I wanted to address that by making things more accessible and actually increasing the interactivity in my lectures. So I think about that first year, of course the issue for me was that I was planning the lectures maybe a week or two in advance of delivering them and, and really just trying to stay ahead of myself. I didn't have time to do the innovative stuff that I'd wanted to do. So in the second year, I took for, from a portion of my lectures maybe the first 15 minutes or so and turned that into a pre-lecture video which the students could then watch at home. So the nature of my lectures is that I give the students a handout which is a skeleton handout and I'm annotating things on the slides during the lecture and, and all of these gaps present an opportunity for a question. So there was interactivity in the first year um, but then I try and replicate that experience in the pre-lecture. So again I give them a handout before the, the recording is issued to them and they then uh, can fill in the gaps as they go along. Again, occasionally in the recording, I'll even say, pause the video here, have a go at writing that equation, and then check your answer against mine. So I am replicating the lecture experience uh, in doing that. So of course, that frees up a slot in my face-to-face -face lecture then for some interactivity. Now, I've shown it here as being at the start of the lecture. It doesn't have to be there, it could be anywhere, or you could just intersperse the interactivity throughout the slot. Uh, but I do tend to do quite a bit at the start, really recapping what we did in the flip lecture, making sure that the understanding is there before we move on. But I will also then incorporate various bits of interactivity throughout the lecture to take advantage of the time that we freed up. So we're making better use of that precious face-to-face -face contact time that we, we don't really have enough of. So the sort of things we can do, uh, using voting pads, obviously something I do a lot of, the peer instruction approach, which I'd heard about from Simon Bates and Ross Galloway, and had discussed at length with Simon Lancaster. Uh, also, time for discussion, student-led Q&A, and even the odd demonstration that we hadn't had time to do in the, in the first year of the course. And for me, actually, a key goal of all of this was to increase students' confidence, particularly in studying independently, but also in the lecture. I'm hoping to get them more engaged and, and therefore benefiting more in terms of their learning. So I did have research questions in mind. I mean, to be fair, we didn't embark on this as a research project, but as I was doing it, I was thinking, well, actually, I can learn something from this. i had been to some of the getting started in pedagogic research events that Tina Overton had organised, and it got me thinking about research questions. So my research questions that guided this work were what are the impacts of a partial flipping approach on students' confidence in the classroom and in their private study? I think confidence is really important. So it's something I always look for when I'm evaluating something because students who are confident are gonna be happier students. And in this day and age, that's particularly important. And also I think they're gonna be more engaged in their studies, which surely will have knock-on consequences, benefits in terms of their learning. Also, I wanted to think, again, to think about benefits. What were the student perceived benefits? What sort of things would they tell us without prompting that we could then identify that were beneficial in terms of their learning? So actually, at the end of that, that year, the second year of teaching on the foundation year, I put a survey out towards the end of the year. At that point, we had around 32 students left, and we got 17 responses, which isn't a bad response rate for the end of the year. Some Likert responses were tabulated. I'll show you that data a bit later. And we also analysed some free text responses. Uh, they were subjected to a thematic analysis. And again, I'll say a bit more about that later. And this was stuff that we were doing in the summer of 2014, which was around the time that our first PhD student started. So that was Tom Wilson. And he was looking at learning technology and chemistry education. And also having spoken about this partial flipping approach to colleagues, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, John Watts, wanted to try this approach with first-year organic chemistry students, which was fantastic because they were looking at undergraduate teaching with a big class size. So it seemed like a great idea to get Tom and John working together on this, something for Tom to get his teeth into, to get his PhD off the ground, um, and to make sure that John had the support he needed to do this effectively. And actually, we decided to take things a stage further. We also wanted to introduce interactivity into the flipped component, and to do that, we used some web software called Zaption, um, 
which sadly has since disappeared and all our work has disappeared into the ether. So little word of warning when you use these things. Uh, but what Zaption allowed us to do was actually to get recordings to pause and then questions would be issued to students like the ones shown on the screen here and they'd respond and those responses were logged and we, they would come back and John would look at them and that would inform just-in-time teaching. I should say that John really took this, uh, really grasped the ball by the horns on this one. Uh, there was one time where I opened my email on a Friday morning and I'd received an email from John at 4am and he'd looked at his data and was really excited because uh, the students had got in a sequence of three questions, they'd got one and three right but generally had got two wrong. And the second question was based around a misconception. So the fact they were getting it wrong, wrong was telling him that the students had the misconception he was looking for. And he therefore was able to address that at the start of the face-to-face -face lecture the next day. So he was really excited about that. And it does show the power of this kind of um, approach. So again, as with the foundation year, uh, we did some evaluation. We collected some data. We actually took advantage of Zaption to collect the free text responses. Uh, but to get a better response rate, we also used clickers then to collect the Likert data. And that gave us this body of data that we could analyse then as part of the research project. So here is some of the data. I'm not going to go through everything. Uh, if you're interested, it has been published and I'll talk about that a bit later. And you can obviously pause this and look at stuff in more detail because I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. Um, actually, the first response here related to the amount of time spent studying chemistry on the foundation year course. It's interesting that it kind of split the students, that we had some that agreed that they spent more time and we had some that disagreed. And actually, the, those were the ones I, I kind of, I'm with them, because the idea of flipping is not to give students more work. It's actually to just reallocate some of the stuff you would do in the lecture and make that homework and bring some of the higher value active stuff into the face-to-face -face session where you can support it more effectively. Um, so I'm with the disagrees on that one. But then again, you can see how it might lead to people studying more, either because they weren't doing much private study previously, so we were giving them some extra stuff to do, or they now feel more engaged and more confident and therefore they're working harder. So hard to know which is the better response on that one. If you look at the rest of the statements, they all correspond to confidence. What's interesting is the fact that the, the numbers going for strongly agree vary from statement to statement. And the one that has the biggest number of responses that strongly agree is the one about confidence in answering questions verbally in class. And obviously one of my goals was to increase confidence. And this was clear in, in the teaching. I could see it myself. More students were prepared to put their hands up to answer questions. And when we had discussions, for example, when we used peer instruction, the quality of the conversations was good and students were confident enough to express their, uh, their thoughts and opinions uh, in a way that we hadn't seen if we tried anything like that in the previous year. So, so I think it made a really big difference. Um, but obviously the qualitative data tells us a bit more. So what we did, as I say, it was a, a, a thematic analysis. It was fairly rudimentary, to be honest. Uh, the, the comments that we'd collected were fairly short and unambiguous, so it was relatively straightforward, and we already knew what we were looking for, so I guess it was a deductive approach, uh, because people had already done work in this area, and we just wanted to see if the benefits of the partial flipping uh, were equivalent to those of the, the, the sort of more fully flipped approaches that other people had evaluated. And also, I, I'd been inspired in this uh, by Michael Seary's work on pre-lecture resources, um, and again, looking at what he'd done and what he'd found and making sure that we were seeing the same sort of benefits. So actually, one of the things Michael talked about was cognitive load, and, and we did see evidence of a reduction in cognitive load in some of the responses. Uh, there were some comments about being better prepared for the scheduled face-to-face -face lectures, as you can see there, and even some questions, or sorry, some comments about confidence. And as I said previously, that was something I was keen on, and good to see this coming out in the comments. Other things that people picked on, up on were the, the availability of more time in lectures for the higher value activity. I hadn't told them that's why we were doing it, although obviously, as I've said to you, that was one of the motivations. It's good to see students picking that up and seeing that as a positive thing. And I've got enjoyment there at the bottom. And actually, I think enjoyment's really important too. If you see this, you, you know, you're making students work hard, you're giving them something you think benefits their learning, and it's nice to see that they're enjoying it too. So. Again, I've got other anecdotal evidence, but this is the stuff that came out of our survey. Now, the data I'm showing here relates specifically to John Watt's work 
on the um, with the organic chemistry course in year one. I mean, there is more data, and there's go look at the publication if you're interested. But again, we were seeing the same sorts of things in terms of reduction of cognitive load, also a better preparation for lectures, and also some comments about feedback. Because, of course, John was asking questions in the flip lecture and then was able to give feedback, as in the case I described previously. Uh, so this was something it was good to see students acknowledging. So really, I mean, the conclusions of that project, I think, and again, you can read this in the, in the chapter, which I'll talk about again in a second. Uh, really, I think we can see that there are benefits. The students do perceive there are benefits to this. Um, students were more engaged. Uh, we got the evidence from the from what we collected, but also just from what I saw in my own teaching. And uh, certainly, as someone who's a teacher at heart, that what you see happening in the classroom uh, that means a lot. It's nice to collect evidence to back it up, but actually, what you see happening in the classroom, that anecdotal stuff, actually, uh, could be really powerful too and, and motivational as a teacher. Uh, so actually, what did we do with this? Well, I went to speak at BCCE. I had an RSC bursary to go over there, over to the States. And it was a well-attended symposium about flipped teaching. And the people who convened that, were Jennifer and Chris over here, invited me to write a book chapter. So we collected all this data. We'd started doing the analysis. And we were thinking of publishing it in an article. But when this invitation arrived, we thought, well, let's put it in this book chapter. On reflection, I'm not sure that was the best thing, because what it means now is that the only people that can read it are people who get the book. Uh, it might have been better to publish it in an article, but hey, we are where we are. And actually, I'm very proud of the fact that this figure here you see on the cover is one of mine. The sketchy blue handwriting will give that away. Um, but yeah, so it, I think it was a positive thing. I'm very happy that we did it. And it's raised the visibility of the stuff we were doing. Um, since then, uh, various colleagues in chemistry have successfully adopted a similar approach. I'm constantly pushing this to try and, and get it uh, sort of more popular. It's a good stepping stone for people who aren't confident enough to fully flip their course. Uh, they don't have to prepare a whole hour's worth of stuff for the face-to-face -face slot. That's the thing that puts a lot of my colleagues off. Increasing the interactivity in a shorter part of a lecture seems to be more attractive. We did some work with school teachers. So one person, Rob Campbell, who some of you may know, uh, actually started using Zaption as well. We didn't, you know, he just took it and ran with it. We didn't really provide any support, but it was nice to see it being done. I've also created a video case study based around this, uh, which is now shown to people on our Postgraduate Certificate of Academic Practice programme as an example of an innovation that they either may adopt themselves or to make them think that this is something that, that they might have other ideas themselves that they could implement um, along similar lines. I'm still using the approach now in all of my lectures, well I'll say all of my lectures, maybe 40% of them actually, um, but engagement is still good, it's one of those things that, that seems to, that it's not a Hawthorne effect thing, but it really does have benefits that carry on perennially. Uh, find the same thing with clickers. Yesterday I went to a college, gave some clickers to sick formers and they were still saying, wow, this is excellent. This is in the era of the smartphone. Um, so I think there are some things which are just going to keep on being beneficial until we completely change our model of teaching. And I think flipped teaching is one of those things. I've also been invited to numerous events and conferences, you know, some international conferences as well, to talk about this work in the wider context of other things that I've been doing. But it's been really good to get out and disseminate this and, and see some other people taking up similar approaches. So just to sort of say where this took us then afterwards, so obviously Tom started off doing this work with John Watts and then John Watts left and moved over to the States. And that kind of uh, put a dampener on the work we were doing in the flip teaching arena. But Tom had other ideas anyway. Um, having used Zaption, having looked at collecting data, this sort of student response data, t we had an idea to, to create something called a laboratory response system, at least that's what we're calling it. And Tom built this software from scratch, it's called LabDog. Um, and as, as I'm recording this, Tom is sitting in his PhD viva, so fingers crossed on that one. Um, hopefully, well, I mean, obviously what we've done here is we've created some software, that's a huge amount of work. Uh, we have got data, obviously, but we need to find a way of turning this into a publication. So hopefully you'll see something on that fairly soon. Also here you can see Steve, uh, that he, he, I've spoken about that work uh, quite a lot. He worked with Tom initially as an undergraduate to develop these self-assessment resources with videos. Um, quite a lot of what we did there was influenced by things we've done on the FLIP teaching project and Steve went on to complete an MPhil where he developed a suite of these resources, shared them with uh, several hundred, for over a thousand A-level students who then responded and provided us with data that supported his MPhil. 
So there were some real benefits that came out of this project. So I think I'll just finish off with some tips for success based on my own personal experiences. First of all, make sure you really want to do it. It's, it's not something to take lightly. This kind of research actually is demanding. <clears throat> you need to have a lot of time to look at what's out there, to think about it, to come up with your own ideas, develop your projects, support students if you've got them. I'll talk more about that later. You need to be really committed and you need to have time for it. And that's a real challenge. You need to learn from my example and, and learn to say no to things. Free up that time. You, you can't do 10 minutes here and 10 minutes there. You need to be able to give up, up blocks of time, days, to be able to fully immerse yourself in what you're doing and, and really get your head around the literature. So time is crucial. Get it built into your do job description because that's something that's been lacking for me. Do consider doing a master's. Like, that's one thing I regret. If I could go back five years and carve out the time to be able to do it, I think that would have put me in a much better position. And some people I know uh, who I respect a lot in the field, I know they did masters. And, and I think that that really helped them. Um, obviously it's not essential, but if you've got the time, uh, I think it's something worth considering. Now the first bit of advice I got from various people, Tina Overton and Ross Galloway among them, was to get your research question right. And it's, again, that's something that we haven't always got right here. Um, really make sure you nail down those research questions as early as possible and then build everything else around that. There's some really good literature out there to help you. Suzanne gave an excellent talk at MISA in 2017 on this and that's been published in New Directions. So plenty of things to look at. If you've got funding for students, make sure you get the right ones. And uh, by right, what do I mean? Well, you need people who really want to do this stuff, not, not people who wanted to be a chemist but couldn't do a chemistry PhD and then meandered over to do something like this. You need someone who's really interested in education. And also, you need to be a bit mindful of projects. If you try to impose a project on a student that they aren't necessarily invested in, then that student probably won't complete. You need to give the student the flexibility in the project to find something they want to pursue so they can take ownership of it and that will be motivational for them. So be careful, you may not be able to do exactly what you want to do and if you try and force that on someone it might, might be problematic. Obviously you've got to be prepared to support the students and for me it's a highlight of the week to sit down and talk to them about what they've been doing um, but you've got to make sure you've got that time there and be prepared to be flexible when things might go wrong here and there, you need to be available to help put things back on track. And this is a really key one, one that I've failed on miserably. Once you've got the material for papers, make sure you get them written. It's really important. This comes back to the time thing. Make sure you've got that time in your job description. You need to talk to your line manager about this and make sure that your workload is adjusted in a way that supports you in doing this because it's beneficial to the department. I regularly have the department saying, oh, we'd love it if you were ref returnable. Well, it's not going to happen until I've got the time to do it. So very important. Uh, make sure you get that right too. So I hope that's been helpful. Uh, I've really enjoyed having the opportunity to talk to you. Please don't hesitate to get in touch with me if you have any questions about anything I've discussed here. I should just put this up, some acknowledgements to uh, some of the people who've uh, been helpful and collaborated on some of these projects and supported me through those, but there are many, many other people out there I could thank. Once again, I'd especially like to thank Suzanne and Michael for the invitation. Uh, it's great to see Serg really sort of taking off, I would say, uh, and really doing a lot of exciting stuff. So good to be part of that. Thank you.